Okay. So we will continue our discussion from where we left off last time, but with a slight change in the scope of what we have been talking about. So we remember this component is all about I/O systems, and the first few lectures we focused on file systems as an example of uh, I/O devices, disks being the example of the I/O device, and file systems being the uh, example of what the OS needs to do to manage that I/O device. So now we are going to take a step back and say, having learned a little bit about one I/O device, let's think about how the OS needs to deal with any any I/O device. Okay, so we'll basically look at what an I/O device looks like from a hardware perspective. What does the OS do from the perspective of the device driver? Okay, the the part of the OS that talks to any I/O device is a device driver. Okay, so we'll look at uh, some key ways to implement device drivers from an I.O. standpoint. It depends a little bit on the I.O. device itself, but there are some general principles that would apply regardless of the type of I.O. devices. So we'll start with some overview of what an I.O. device looks like, and then we will go and look at how do you write uh, device drivers in a few different ways okay, to do I.O. Okay. So uh, if you remember, the second or third lecture where we said what are the key components of your machine, it's processor, there is memory, there are I.O. devices and the system bus. The system bus is the component that allows all of these other components to talk to one another. So we still have a system bus, but now we have several different I.O. devices connected to that system bus. Okay? Now in general, a typical I.O. device, the simplest I.O. device is have uh, this abstraction called a device port. Okay? The port is essentially a set of registers that the machine uses to send data to the device and receive data to the device. Think of these as registers on the device itself. Okay? So the machine itself, the CPU has access to some registers and it uses them to do computation. And now you can think of an I.O. device in the simplest possible I.O. device as basically a port which is four registers. Okay? Uh, so these are registers on the device itself, not on the machine or not on the CPU. So there is a status register that's simply going to tell the CPU what is the status of the device. Is it busy performing some I.O.? Is it ready to receive the next command? Or is there an error condition that has resulted from either some problem with the hardware or whatever command was issued to it previously? So, so you can simply read. Okay, this is clearly a register that you read. You can read the status register and get what uh, get you know, information. What's the status of the device? Okay. There's a control register, as the name suggests. That's the register in which the CPU is going to write out what command you want the device to perform. Okay, so it's a register whereby you can just send a command. Okay, so a command is essentially a byte. And depending on what the value of that byte is, the uh, device will interpret it accordingly and do whatever it has been asked to do. Okay, so that's the command to perform. Most uh, common commands are read or write, okay, and the location from where to read or write, if the location uh, matters to the device. Okay, and then there are two registers, a data in register and a data out register. Okay, data in register is essentially the data that you're sending into the device. Okay, so if you want to write to a device, you write a byte, or a word, let's call it a word, not a byte, a word into the device in register and then the device will actually take that value and do something. With it. And if you're trying to read, you basically have to uh, read out whatever is in the device out register and that's the value that that device has produced for based on the command that you ask the device to perform. Okay. So simplest devices, regardless of what the device is, okay. uh, it could be a keyboard, it could be a mouse, it could be some other device, will have four registers. Okay, there will be more sophisticated versions of devices, but this is what a simple hardware device looks like. Yes, question. Uh, if these data registers only hold one word and the device and the CPU are communicating directly, doesn't that mean that ev for every word that the CPU needs to send it, that the CPU needs to start running again? Yes. So for the question is, process. if the simple devices have only one register and the CPU needs to send a set of words or some large amounts of data to the device or read, we have to do one byte at a time. That is indeed the case if you have a device that looks like this. And we will look at abstractions that allow you to do something 
that doesn't require the CPU to be in the loop for every byte. If you're going to write one byte at a time, that's a lot of work that the CPU has to do. Okay, think of a disk. If disks looked like this, and you wanted to write an entire block, let's say a sector was 512 bytes, you would have to do this one byte at a time or one word at a time. So that's going to be a lot of work. And this is precisely where we are going to look at how do you write device drivers to uh, ensure that the CPU doesn't have to do needless work. Okay, that's basically what is coming. Okay, but that's what a typical device looks like. Four registers. Okay, uh, data, command register, data in, data out, and status. Okay. There is a, a piece of the device, piece of hardware called the controller, and the controller is responsible for receiving commands from the CPU typically and translating them to device action. So every hardware device will have a controller. And there will be a device disk controller, there will be a mouse controller and so on. We'll look at that in the picture on the next slide. Okay. So this is the device itself, that's the controller to which the device is attached. And then you have the other, these are the registers of the device, that's the device itself and there's a device controller. Okay. And this will be applicable regardless of the type of the device. Okay. It could be printer, keyboard, menu, modem, mouse, doesn't matter. Okay, so this is the picture that I was referring to. You have here a disk. This is an IDE disk. So you have an IDE disk controller. You have a SCSI controller for SCSI disks. SCSI controller also has this notion of its own bus to which different disks can be attached. So then this controller will control all of those disks, okay, not just one of them. You may have a expansion bus. In so if you have a PC where let's say you have a PCI bus and it has additional slots can plug in new devices and okay, that's an expansion bus for which there's an interface and you can have different devices hanging off it. If you have a USB keyboard, for instance, that will be connected to a USB bus, okay, which will be a type of an expansion bus. We may have other types of expansion buses as well. Okay, the thing to keep in mind is there is a device and there's a controller. Okay, as I mentioned last time, a controller has a tiny mic, as the name suggests, it has a tiny CPU on it that is responsible for interacting with that device. Okay, this is different from the main CPU. This is a tiny microcontroller that only talks to that device. Okay, so it has ability to interpret what commands have been sent to the device and uh, instruct the device to do a, uh, carry out the appropriate command. Okay, so this is the controller and then you have the hardware itself, which is simply going to be something like a mice or a disk. Okay, so this is the picture to keep in mind as we go along. Okay, any questions on this? Okay. So that was the hardware view of what the I.O. devices looks like. This is basically our OS view of how OS based devices. Okay. So the boxes at the very bottom, right? these are all the devices that the machine has uh, access to. You have SCSI disks, keyboard, mouse, PCI bus, floppy disks, USB devices, network cards, graphics card. These are all I.O. devices. Yeah, all of those devices are each device is con connected to a controller. This is also a piece of hardware, as I said, that's the tiny CPU on the uh, controller that talks to the device. So, for every device, there's a controller. Okay? So, this is the hardware side of it. Everything about this is software, and you will see that the piece of software that talks to each device is the device driver. For every device you have in your system, you have a device driver. Okay? The device driver is the part of the OS that understands the specific hardware details of the device. Okay. Typically, the OS kernel itself abstracts out the hardware uh, specifics, okay. depending on, let's say you have a network card, whether it's below a card from vendor A or vendor B, is not actually uh, known to the kernel itself that in, uh, the uh, information is in the device driver. Okay. So, device driver is the lowest layer of the kernel that talks to individual devices. It understands what commands that device can accept and even for the same type of device, let's say we may have 10 different kinds of keyboards from 10 different vendors. Some of them may need their own drivers. Okay, so that's the job of the device driver to have within the code understanding of how to communicate with the device, how to do I over the device, what com com command set does that device actually understand. Okay, all of that code is in here. Okay. And then you have the I.O. subsystem, which is basically the layer above. And that layer is going to take generic commands, say read or write, hand it to the device driver. The device driver will take an 
abstract or generic read or write request and translate that to a specific command, a read or a write command that that device understands and send that command into the register, the command register that we talked about. Okay, the same read command may be a different byte for device A than device B. Okay, they will all do read, but what command to set uh, in that register depends on the type of the device and the command set it will understand. Okay. So what we are going to do is actually understand how to implement these device drivers in some high level way. Okay, we don't have time to go into very nitty gritty details of device driver, but there are some general principles that will apply okay, depending on what kind of device it is and how to ensure performance and efficiency and so on. Yeah, so this is a picture you want to keep in mind as well as we go along. Okay, so this slide is just illustrating that the ports that I mentioned. So every device you have in your system is uh, accessed through an address. Like anything else, each device has a unique address and that's the address that you use to communicate with the device. And the address of the device is typically the address of the port that I just mentioned. Okay, so, this, so each type of device has some reserved addresses for it. So that basically shows you uh, here is a graphics controller. Okay. So these are the hex addresses that you use typically to talk to a graphics controller. The way uh, the CPU is, or the OS is going to send a command is it's going to use the address of that device which will be in that range there okay, depending on what vendor it is and so on. Okay, and then it will basically send a request to that address which will essentially be sent to that device. Okay, so each device, think of it as a device is listening on its address whenever uh, the, on the system bus you send a command with an address on it, the device is, the controller is listening and if it sees its address then it knows that the command was sent to it. Okay, because the bus is a broadcast medium. You simply put out a command and say this command is meant for this device and you send the device address. Every controller is listening on that bus. Okay, they are all hanging off the same bus as we showed here. So the CPU is simply going to stick a command on this bus and all of these devices will see that command. Okay, and the way a controller knows whether the command is meant for it or not is that you assign an address and, and you send a, you attach the address to the command so you know. If it's meant for you, then you will just read it. And if not, you just ignore it. Okay, so this is how addressing is going to work. So every I.O. device will have an address. This is decided by the hardware. So all that the OS needs to do is know what devices are present and use the right addresses to send commands. And those are referred to as port numbers on most machines. When you when you have more, like when you add another device, do the address ranges for the existing devices shrink to make room for the new one? So typically the question is, if you add a new device, will you, ha you have to assign it an address, will the address range shrink? So typically what happens is this is de decided by the hardware vendor. Okay, so they have to pick something that is reasonable and unique. And this range is actually significantly larger than what is shown here. Okay, this is just an illustration of some common devices, but every device will have its own address. And it's not that the range is going to shrink, you have to find out what is the type of the device and you pick one unique address within that ring. But sometimes what happens is uh, you can reuse, so what you don't want is on a particular machine you don't want conflicts, you don't want two devices to have the same port number. Right? So you could basically, if it's a disk, regardless of the vendor, you could assign that disk to a certain address. Okay? So you can say that this disk has this address. And then if you have another disk, it would have to pick a different address. So to some extent, this is decided by the vendor as well as the type of the, the device and the machine. Okay, so what you want is a unique way to address these devices. Across machines you may use is let's say 3D0 can be used for two different graphics cards or two different machines. So long as you have one graphics card answering to it on one machine and only one, that's good enough. So if there's a device missing, there's just an unused address range. Yeah, so if there's a device missing, that address is not going to be valid. Okay. Right? So it's not that you have to have all of these devices. Okay. Yeah, so this is the range. So now given this hardware background, we need to start thinking about how to, or not thinking about, discussing how to write your device drivers. So uh, 
I talked about cold numbers. Now that's a fairly low level of uh, writing code to access devices. Okay. Most operating systems will also provide a slightly higher level abstraction in order to access the devices. Right. So you, there may be scenarios where you may be writing an application program that has to interact with the device. Okay. Let's say you're writing a printer, or writing to a printer, or reading or writing from raw disk. What you don't want is the application programmer having to deal with some very low level programming like this saying go to this hex address and read or write. That, that's too low level. That's something that a device driver can do. But at higher levels within the kernel or applications that may be talking to devices, this could be system services as well. You want some higher level abstraction to talk to devices. Okay? Now, there are many ways to provide this higher level abstraction. One particular way that's adopted by a Unix-like operating system is to use file names, unique file names to access devices. Okay? And internally, a file name is mapped to that device address that I just showed you on the previous slide. Okay? So you can simply open a device as a file and it has a unique name associated with it just as there's a unique address, it will have a unique name. And then you just open that device and you read to and write to it like you're reading and writing to a file except that you are actually reading and writing to hardware, okay, not a file. But you see a file abstraction in order to do I.O. And I'll show you an example. So just to give you some sense, so all that, if you take any Linux machine or even Macs for that matter, all of the hardware devices that you can actually read or write to, they appear in this directory called slash dev, dev stands for devices. And you'll see a whole bunch of them that you can then open and start reading and writing without having to figure out the low level details. Okay, so let me show you. So this is uh, the slash dev directory. Okay. So if you just look at all the files in them, okay, there are lots of files here, but these are not real files. They're actually just names that stand for device. Okay, so you will see there is a Bluetooth modem. Okay, so slash dev slash this file name is actually the hardware device that's the Bluetooth device on that machine. You know, if you wanted to read or write to Bluetooth, you could simply do a file open on this device and start reading or writing bytes to it, just as you would read or write bytes. And internally what the OS will do is it knows that that device, this is not a real file, but this is a hardware device. So it will do the appropriate translation and work with the device driver to read, allow you to read or write. Now, of course, you need permissions to, to be able to do that. If the device is owned by root, then here you can read or anyone can read or write. But if the permissions are set so that users, uh, user programs can't read or write, then you will say you will not have the permission. But if you are allowed to do it, then you are. Okay, so you will see that the disk is also a device. Slash dev slash disk zero is the di di hardware disk on this machine. Okay, so rather than actually reading or writing files, if you have the right permissions, you can read or write blocks directly by opening that device, doing a seek to a particular offset. And if you read or write, you are reading or writing raw blocks to that device. Okay, not files at that point. Okay. So you will also have slash dev slash mouse. If you open that device and start listening on that file, you will any mouse clicks will be actually sent to you through this file interface. Okay. This is merely a convenience. Internally, what's happening is this, all of this are mapped to this port numbers uh, that I just showed you. And there are actual IO commands being sent to the device drive. Okay? So what Unix has done is said, users know how to deal with files. You know how to open a file, read or write. We'll simply use that API and allow you to read or write to IO devices as well by just giving a name, a file name to an IO device, okay, which is easy to understand. Okay, so you may have, and there are, I didn't show all of the list in that directory, there are USB devices, there are a whole bunch of other devices as well. Okay, so in the Unix world, uh, other than the device driver which has to deal with the low level details of hex addressing and so on, anything above the device driver, whether it's in the kernel space or in the user space, can access those IO devices using file names. Okay, that's basically an abstraction. Now internally lots of other things have to happen. You need access control to ensure that only the right applications or even portions of the kernel are able to read or write to those devices. There is going to be buffering and caching as you will see for performance reasons. There's going to be IO scheduling. 
we already saw an example of IO scheduling for disk scheduling. I said you could do this in the device driver or you could do this at the hardware con disk controller. Okay. So if you have a simple disk that does not have any sophisticated disk controller, your device driver will do the IO scheduling. In that case, it was disk scheduling that we talked about last time. Okay. Or if the device supports it, then you just send the commands and the device will decide in what order to service your request. So all of these things have to be actually dealt with in the device driver and we are going to look at some of these issues uh, in the rest of the class. Okay, any questions on this? The port addressing, the device addressing using file names and so on. Okay. So this slide shows you the very simplest way of writing a device driver. Okay, this is the very basic implementation of a device driver. And what the device driver essentially does is it allows its piece of code that sits in the kernel as communicating with the device. It allows you to do I.O. with the device. That's the job of the device driver. And the simplest way to do this is through what is referred to as polling. Okay. And what uh, is done is as follows. So let's say the device driver is executing. The device driver has been handed a command okay, that it is supposed to now send to the device itself. So it's basically this is the code in the device driver. So you are going to sit and busy wait until the status of the device becomes idle. Okay, so what the device driver will have, okay, if you remember, there are four ports here. There's a status register, control register, and data in and data out. So what the device driver will do is it will sit in a loop and keep reading the status register until the device is ready to accept the next command. Okay, until the device is uh, idle or ready to accept the next command, you can't send it anything. Okay. It may be working on something that has been sent to it already. So you are going to do busy wait. Okay. That's, and then once you are ready to accept the command, you take the command that has been handed to the device driver and you will write it out in the command register. Okay. Maybe it's read or write. These are the two simplest commands that a device driver would have to implement. Okay. So you write it in the device register. If you are writing to the device, you have to write out the byte you are writing to the device in the data out. So it's an output operation. Okay. If you are reading from the device, then you will basically just say issue a read command to the control register and wait and eventually the data will appear in the data in register. Okay. And uh, once this is done, you are basically going to say ready, you have said issued the request and you are going to issue say ready and at that point the controller is going to set the status register to busy. Okay. This says now the device is active and it's processing a request. Okay. And what you are now simply going to do is sit and wait for the I.O. command to complete, okay, that's your device driver and eventually you are basically going to uh, figure out that the command has completed and if it was an uh, uh, input command, you are going to read the data from the data in register. If it was an output command, you are simply going to look at the status register to see if the command succeeded or not. Okay, the status register will eventually tell you whether your read or write command succeeded or if it failed or something else happened. Okay, at this point, you know that your command has finished and you are going to, if you are reading data, you will read it from that register and hand it to the, the higher levels of the OS, which may hand it back to the application. Okay. So it's a small, small set of steps, okay, but there is a lot of, as you can imagine, this is a very simple device driver. It is using this notion of polling. There's a whole bunch of busy wait going on and all of this is just to write, read or write one word to this device. So you are doing all of this work to simply write one byte or maybe a one integer to this device, four words or four bytes rather to this device. It's a lot of work to just do something simple. So we are going to see more efficient implementation of device drivers, but this is the most basic one. Any questions on this? Okay, so what do you think are issues that we need to resolve to make this more efficient? Yes. Okay, so you need to be able to do read or write more than one byte and we'll see ways to do that. That's definitely true. Anything else? Yes. Probably do like asynchronous signaling. Okay, so you don't want to sit and wait. Okay, you say, okay, go read. And then you sit there in a loop looking at the register, has my command finished, has my command finished, has my command finished. After a thousand loops, you may say, okay, command is finished. 
didn't do anything useful. You're just sitting, the device driver is sitting and looping there, waiting for the command to finish. Okay. So you don't want to do that. That's basically essentially wasted polling. What you would rather do is do this asynchronously where you issue a command and say go. And when the command finishes, the device will tell you it has finished and then you can go and resume where you left off. Okay, so this is your this is synchronous where you are actually waiting for the device to or blocking is the other term that's used. You are waiting for the device to tell you uh, when it's done. Instead, you would rather just go off do something else and have the device uh, interrupt you. Okay, so we know how interrupts work. Okay, so we are going to use interrupts to build more efficient device drivers. So this is basically the second somewhat more efficient. Okay, still one byte at a time. So we have two problems. One is we are writing and reading one byte at a time. We want to relax that assumption. The other problem is we are sitting and waiting for the command to finish and wasting CPU cycle, essentially doing a busy wait. Okay, so we are going to address each of these in steps. Okay, the first, uh, what we are going to do is simply use interrupts to get rid of our busy wait and okay, do things asynchronous. And then the next step, we are going to see how to write larger, larger chunks of data uh, without having to write one byte at a time or read one. Okay, so this one is going to use interrupt. Okay, this is an interrupt based device driver. So rather than busy wait, all you are going to do is do something very simple. It's there is a figure here which we don't really need. You are going to issue the command. Okay, you are going to wait first, wait for the device to be idle. Then you issue the command and then you go off and do something and tell the device interrupt me when you are done. Okay, so then the OS may go and schedule other processes, do whatever else it needs to do. At some later point in time, the command that was issued to the device is going to finish right? and the device is going to raise an interrupt. Okay, this is the primary reason why interrupts were actually put into the hardware because IO devices were slow. Okay, so you basically tell the device, go off, do this IO, interrupt me when done. Okay, so then the device will raise an interrupt. This will basically cause uh, the, word, the OS to suspend whatever process was being executed, jump into the interrupt handler, which is basically going to tell the device driver saying, your command has finished. The device driver will then go off and pick whatever, the look at the status register, see if the command was successful. If it was successful and the command was read, you will read from the device register. Okay. So all that we have eliminated is the busy wait from the time you submitted the request or issued the command the time when the command actually finishes. So during that period, the previous example you sat and waited. In this case, you go off and do something useful and you are interrupted at a later time. Okay, so most device drivers will be written this way okay, because this is a more efficient way. A key, think of a keyboard or a mouse device driver. Okay, so it's not that the device keyboard driver is sitting in a loop waiting for you to press the next key. Okay, then the OS is just going to, you're going to max out the CPU just waiting. Okay, what happens is when you press a key on your keyboard or when you click on the mouse, okay, that action triggers an interrupt. Okay, then the keyboard driver will then go and see what is the key that you pressed. Okay, the key value will be stored in the data in register. Okay, you're simply going to go and read that value. For every key, there is a hex value. Okay, when you press a key, that hex value gets written into the register. And then when the keyboard driver goes and simply when it's interrupted, it's going to go pick out that value and then give it to whatever application saying this user has pressed the A key or whatever the key may be. And then you get processing. Okay, so interrupts are the most common way of implementing these device drivers. Same is true with mice or any of these other device drivers. Is that clear? Any questions here? Okay. Uh, these are interrupt vectors which I will not worry about. As I said, every uh, device will have a way to raise an interrupt. Okay, these are just the initial ones. There are lots of different interrupts here that we have not shown. So after you issue the command, there will be an interrupt. Each interrupt has a unique ID. If you remember, there was a trap table or an interrupt ta vector table we talked about fairly early on. That will basically tell the OS what to do. For each device, it will point back, let's say, to the device driver, which may then go and uh, process that interrupt. Okay. So this is somewhat more interesting, uh, is the problem of how do you read or write more than one byte at a time? And that's clearly very slow. Okay. 
for a keyboard mouse that's okay because one keystroke is one byte okay. but if you're reading or writing to disk if you're writing a block let's say so one kilobyte block doing this 1024 times just to write a block is, is going to be wasteful if you're writing to a graphics card where you have to output let's say 10,000 pixels on the screen if you have to write one pixel at a time okay, it's going to take a lot of time for you to actually see anything appear on your screen okay, so you want to have more efficient ways to read or write to IO devices when you're doing bulk data transfers bulk data input or output in okay, the right way uh, to do this is use this abstraction called direct memory access okay, or referred to as DMA now there's a piece of hardware on your machine called the DMA controller what it allows you to do is allows the device to directly read or write from memory without the CPU in the loop okay, until now what happened is you had some data you wanted to read or write let's say you want to write to a device you have a piece of data you tell the CPU saying go rewrite that entire chunk out and the CPU takes the first byte writes it out, the second byte writes it out, third byte writes it out. So the CPU has to take every individual word and write to the uh, device. Okay. Now you could ask why should the CPU do that? Why not let the CPU directly point the device saying here is a buffer, it has n bytes. Okay. Go take those n bytes and write them out and don't ask me to give you one byte at a time I just pointed you to the entire chunk now you can go and write the entire thing out or, or if it's read you point it to a buffer saying go read some amount of data and put it in this buffer okay, but let's not do it one byte at a time as the CPU has to be involved so the CPU issues the first command and then it's done right? and it's the job of the DMA controller to enable direct memory access okay, it will basically work with the device controller the DMA controller works with the device controller and allows the device to get direct access to RAM, to some piece of RAM. Okay. So, I think there was a controller here. Maybe not here. Okay. So, the way it would work is as follows. There's a DMA controller, there's a CPU. There's RAM, which is main memory, there's a device DMA controller, there's an IO device that's connected to the device controller, there's a DMA controller. So what the CPU will do is tell in some sense to both the device and the DMA controller saying here is the buffer which could be n bytes in size okay. go read from this buffer and write it out to the device or if you are reading from the device and go read some chunk of data and then put it in this buffer okay. and then at that point the CPU is done the device controller the DMA controller has access to this piece so it will work with the device to actually allow it to read or write larger chunks of data okay. but the CPU is no longer in the path whether the device chooses to write one byte at a time, few bytes at a time is up to the device, whatever the hardware implementation allows you to do. But it can then read or write directly to this chunk of data without the CPU being in the loop. The CPU can go off and write, sort of implement, uh, not implement, execute other applications, other processes and so on. And when eventually when the IO command completes, you'll still raise an interrupt. And at that point the device driver will know that this chunk of data has been written out or some data has appeared from the device and has been put into this buffer. Okay, this is an OS buffer, a kernel buffer. Okay. So essentially you are giving an IO device direct access to RAM. This is why it's referred to as direct memory access through the DMA controller. Okay, the device may be dumb but the DMA controller will work with the device to get, let it have access to RAM, read or write from RAM. Okay. Is that clear? So this is basically the way you will write uh, most device drivers which involve reading or writing larger amounts of data. Disks being one example where you read or write blocks, you don't read or write bytes. The graphics card is another example where if you want to display an image, okay, let's say that's some number of pixels, you stick those pixels here, tell the graphics controller saying go read whatever is in the, uh, read from that buffer and write it out to this location on the screen. 
Okay, so then the DMA controller will take those pixel values, stick it into the graphics card, and the graphics card will output that those pixel values onto your screen. Okay, so these are the ways by which we'll typically write more sophisticated device drivers. Okay, now the thing to keep in mind is essentially this DMA controller is a small CPU okay, that's accessing RAM. The CPU is also executing other programs that also might be accessing RAM. You're fetching instructions and uh, fetching, uh, reading or writing data. So there is going to be more contention on the system bus. The okay, system bus is the, uh, the has arbitration logic which says the CPU wants to write to some region of RAM and the DMA controller wants to write to this region of RAM. In the same clock cycle, you can't let both of those things happen. So it will basically decide who gets to go in what order. So there's going to be more contention on the system bus, but that's okay because the system bus has high bandwidth, high capacity. It can handle multiple devices trying to access RAM at the same time. These are all fast devices, so that, that's fine. But what you cannot have happen is CPU is reading or writing from RAM and the DMA controller is reading or writing to RAM in the same clock cycle. Okay, you can stagger them in different clock cycles and have concurrency, but you can't do that in the same cycle. So system bus still has to handle the higher amount of contention that is going to occur because there are multiple entities reading or writing to RAM at the same time. So the entities being the CPU, the DMA controller and there may be multiple devices. Okay? So you may be reading or writing to disk and writing to the graphics card. So there may be multiple DMAs in progress all at the same time. Okay? So you have to basically deal with all of that contention. Okay, so that's basically DMA based device drivers. Okay, so now what we look at is some higher level abstractions that you need to think about when you read or write to devices. Okay. So the OS provides some standard interfaces to uh, these devices and then when you write a device driver, you use the, that interface in order to interface with the rest of the OS. And then at a higher level, there are other things you need to think about as to what that type of the device is. Okay, one is what is the transfer unit to the device? Okay, there are two types of devices typically. What is referred to as a character device and block devices. In a character device, you write one character at a time, which is a byte at a time. In a block device, you typically write one block or chunk of data at a time. Okay, you don't typically write one character at a time. And depending on the type of the device, they may be one or the other. Okay, so what are some examples of character devices? Keyboard. keyboard is a good example of a character device. You read or write one keystroke. Every time you press a key, you have to take an action. You have to figure out what key was pressed and do something. You can hand it to the application to process. A keyboard is a character device, a mouse is a character device, many devices are character devices. Okay, we already encountered block devices, disk being the most common example. Okay, disk is a block device because you read or write sectors. A sector is a chunk of data. You typically don't read or write one byte. Even if you needed to read or write one byte, you have to minimally read or write one sector. Okay, because you cannot, fundamentally the unit of I.O. is a sector. Okay, so we'll see how to do the translation between I/O sizes and uh, device block sizes in a later slide. But they are block devices, okay, and you can actually see this. If you go back to the devices I was showing you, okay, so if you see the first indicator here, C stands for a character device. Okay, you'll see that this Bluetooth modem is a character device because it's reading or writing one byte at a time out on Bluetooth. You'll see a disk. You'll see a B there that indicates it's a block device. Okay, you basically can read or write blocks, you cannot read or write bytes or character. So depending on the type of the device, the OS will essentially expect that I.O. is done in that unit, whether it's a character or a block. Okay, that's the simplest thing, which is the what is the unit of I.O. There are many other things. There may be access method. Okay, the device may be sequential or random access. Now many, most devices will be sequential. A keyboard is a sequential device. Okay, the keyboard is basically producing a sequence of key, key clicks, keyboard clicks. And you are simply reading them in sequence. Okay. You don't typically jump, if you let's say type two or three keys 
very quickly one after another. The keyboard device is not going to say, let me look at the third key press first and then the first two. You simply process them in the order in which they were produced. So that's a sequential device. Okay, discs, as we know, random access device. Okay, graphics card, random access. You can probably just update a portion of the screen so you can simply read or write to some region of the graphics card buffer directly. Okay, you don't have to basically write to the whole thing in sequence. Okay, many different, so there are different ways by which you can access devices. Okay, tape drives, sequential. Printer, sequential. You basically, if you print a page, your printer doesn't actually print some of the last line and then start printing random things, simply printing it in the order in which you send data. Okay, so it's a sequential device. So you really need to think about what the device is and how you are going to access it. Okay, most devices are straightforward. You just simply process I.O. in the order in which it comes in. But some devices are not, like disks and graphics card and so on. There is this timing issue, which is whether it's a synchronous device or an asynchronous device. We basically said uh, that most devices are asynchronous, but the iOS calls could be synchronous or asynchronous. So your polling based device drivers, you are going to be blocking. Your interrupt based, which is what most devices are, you have non blocking. Blocking, uh, polling based are only used in uh, low end operating systems that may be for embedded devices and so on. You don't want to do polling based in a general purpose operating system and waste CPU cycles. Okay, but in very low end devices where it's single purpose, it's okay to do polling because there's nothing else to do. If the device doesn't produce data, there may be no, not much else to do on your machine. Okay. So the timing of the device is important. Okay. Shareable or dedicated is another issue. What this says is can multiple users or applications access that device at once or is it one user at a time? Okay, so uh, the disks are a good example where multiple files can be open, multiple applications are accessing the disks at the same time. Many devices is basically one application can open it and do something at any given time. Okay, then you want to do something else that other request has to wait. A okay, printer is a good example. One print job can print at a time. Okay, if there are multiple jobs come in, they have to be sequentialized. Okay, they are not shareable. Okay, speed. It depends on the device itself at what speed you can communicate. For most devices, uh, for I.O., there's something called a baud rate. Okay, if you know anything about modems, you may have heard this term, otherwise you probably don't know what it is. It's the bit rate that which you can use to communicate with devices. Okay. Most devices are very, I.O. devices are slow. Okay, you can communicate with them at speeds of bytes per second, thousands of bytes per second. Okay, very slow device. Except for the graphics card or not. Network cards is an example of a faster device. Can communicate, let's say, at megabits or gigabit speeds. But most devices are not like that. You basically communicate with them very slowly. And then there may be the issue of is this an input device, an output device, or both. Keyboard mice are example of input only devices. You can't send anything to a keyboard. You can only read from it. Disks are both. So here are two examples. It says keyboard is a sequential character device. A disk is a block device which is random or sequential, depends on the I.O. Okay. Now depending on these characteristics, these are hardware characteristics or devices, you will have to write the right code in your device driver. Okay. If it's a random device, a random access device rather, there may be in addition to saying read or write, you may have to specify the location for reading or writing. You can't just say write. It doesn't make sense if it's a random access, you have to say where to write, like a disk. In a keyboard, you don't say where to read from. You don't say go and read the key called A. You just wait for some key to be pressed and you just read whatever has been pressed. So there is no location information. Okay, so the device drivers that you write will be very specific to the device itself. And all of these characteristics would have to come in in terms of how you write code. Question? Are there, output only Are there output only devices? Many. Printers, graphics cards, they are all output only devices. Monitors which are connected to graphics cards. Okay, so this is simply summarizing what we just talked about, uh, just by giving examples of character devices, terminals, block devices, disks, sequential modems, 
Bluetooth modems or whatever computer network modems are an example. Random access CD-ROMs, discs are random access. Uh, I think I mentioned most of these. Okay, so we said write only. I just give an example of a graphics card. Read only keyboard CD-ROMs. Read write discs. So different kinds of devices. Depending on what the device is, the device driver may be simple or more complicated. Okay. Okay, so it's a little more details on writing block devices and writing character device drivers. Okay, block devices basically need to, device driver needs to specify a much broader set of commands that you will use to communicate with the device driver. So you will have the usual read or write, but you will also have a C equivalent of a seek which says go and read or write to this location. Okay, seek will allow you to write to a particular location or a random access block device. Okay. In a character device, the device driver is simply projecting a very simple interface which is a get and a put. Get says read the next byte, put says write, to write one byte. Okay. Fairly straightforward uh, device drivers. Okay. Now at application level, there may be libraries that do more than that. Okay, that's something you need to keep in mind. Okay, so now let's talk about this important issue of I.O. buffering. So like I had mentioned last time, if you remember when we were talking about disks, I said that this controller or the disk itself has a small piece of memory on it which is used for caching or buffering. Okay, and I gave the specific example of if you are reading, if you seek to a track and you are reading some sectors, you can read additional data and you stick it into a buffer. And then if new requests come in and the data has been already read, then you can simply just pick it up from the buffer without having to issue another command. Okay. So I.O. buffers are essentially used to deal with speed mismatches. Okay. The de I.O. device is very slow. Okay. So I'll draw a picture here. So you have applications and the OS. Okay. And then you have buffer. And then here you have a device which has a controller and the device. So this slow, this runs on the CPU which is fast. So there is typically a speed mismatch between how fast the CPU can process data and how fast the device can process data. IO devices are fundamentally slow. So to deal with this mismatch, you can use this intermediate uh, piece of memory which we will call a buffer to essentially store data that needs to be written out or read from it. Okay. The buffer, as we will see on the next slide, will also act as a cache, okay, which will allow us to have perf provide performance improvement to the application. And the buffer is used for many different things. Okay. One thing, specific thing is going to use for is to deal with a mismatch in the you amount of data application wants to write and the amount of data a device needs to write. Okay. Let's take an example where you go, you write an application that reads one byte from a file. Okay. You know how to write code that's going to simply open a file and read one byte from it, okay, one character from it, that's a byte. Okay. Now think about how the OS has to process this request. Okay. So this, so first of all, this is in a file system, so the OS will have to figure out which block of the file is it, it will look at the inode and figure out the block information and so on. But let's assume that you have figured out that this byte is in a certain block, a okay, block n of the file, uh, of the disk. Okay. But now, because the disk is a block device, okay, you can't read or write one byte. Okay, you can only read or write blocks. Okay, so how should the device driver or the OS process this application level? Okay, so let's assume the byte you are trying to read, let's say this is a disk. Okay, so this is a block and you are trying to read one byte from that block. Okay, that's what this request has to translate when you go to the I.O. device. But then the issue is you cannot actually read one byte from the disk. It imposes a constraint that you can only write, read or write in units of sectors. Right, so what, what are all the things that you will need to do to deal with this mismatch? Okay, this is a mismatch between the size of the I.O. the application wishes to perform and the size of the I.O. 
that the OI or the device is imposing on you, which is, a, which is different in this case. And this is one byte, that's one block. Yes? It seems pretty reasonable to uh, fetch the entire block from disk and then do it, like extract a byte. Okay. So that's the most straightforward thing you will do. You'll figure out what block that byte resides in. Even though you requested one byte, you're going to do extra work. Read the whole block. Okay, this block is going to come and sit in memory here, in the buffer. Okay. The entire block is in buffer. The application only requested one byte, so you're going to take the byte that was requested and give it to the application. Okay. And the block will stay in the buffer. Okay, because if then, if you say, now give me the next byte, okay, you know that the next byte is likely to be in the same block. So the block has multiple bytes. In this case, you can simply pick the next byte from the buffer and return. So this next request will finish very quickly because there is no I.O. that's going to be triggered as a result of it. You've already gotten the data and you're sticking, uh, you're stuck it into the buffer. Okay. So multiple I.O. requests from the application may only trigger one I.O. request at the disk level because you're fetching more data than may be requested. You know, put it in RAM. Okay, so the next I/O request may simply be go to the cache. In this case, it's the buffer cache, and fetch that data or byte, and then give it to the application. Okay, so if you actually go and time your I/O request, you will see that this is happening. Okay, you open a file, and you read the first byte, and you put a timer, and you see how long it took. It will actually trigger. Hopefully, if the file was not read previously by any other application, the first I/O request will trigger a real disk request. The next request, if it's in the same block, if you're reading a byte, it will be in the same block, you'll see finishes very quickly. Okay, this is because you put a buffer to deal with this mismatch. Okay, so there are many reasons to use the buffer. One is to deal with this mismatch. So there are mismatches between the device and CPU. There are mismatches between the data transfer sizes. That's the example I just showed you, where you are reading application has no constraint. It can read or write what, however many bytes it wants. Okay. You could have asked for uh, one megabyte rather than one byte, then you would have fetched multiple blocks, not one block. Or you could ask for one byte, which will be sort of a part of a block, so you would at least fetch that block. Okay, so you have different data transfer sizes. Okay, so here's an, another example where, uh, let's say you're using FTP to fetch a file. Okay, now the file comes from the network in units of packets. Okay, the file may be large. But the network has this restriction that you can send one packet at a time. So what you have to do at the OS level is take this file okay, and then chop it up into network packets, send each packet at a time. Okay, this is the opposite problem where your size is bigger than the chunk. So here you have FTP running. Okay, this is your network card. Okay, so this is your NIC, network interface card. And then packets which are smaller chunks of data are appearing over the network and then you are going to stick them in the buffer and then reassemble the file because the file consists of smaller chunks of packets that are coming over the network. So you will basically reassemble the whole file because they come in smaller pieces and then give that to the application. Okay. Exact opposite of what is happening in the disk case where the network support, the card supports smaller chunks of I.O. You are trying to read a bigger chunk. Yeah, so you have different data transfer sizes and you may want to deal with the, the uh, fact that the device is itself slow. That's another reason to use a buffer. Okay. Now most I.O. devices will use some buffer or the other. The most common case is the file system, which is where lots of devices, uh, not lots of devices, lots of I.O. happens. So basically the buffer also serves as a cache, as you can imagine. Okay, the buffer is storing some subset of the blocks that you have fetched from this or some subset of the blocks that you want to write to this. Okay, so essentially, whenever you have a buffer, you are using it also as a cache. And that brings up this whole issue of how are you going to manage this cache. Okay, several things that have to be done. That done. Okay, so here is now we, uh, how a read or write system call will work in the presence of a cache. Okay, when we did the implementation of read or write, we assume that that's actually going to trigger I.O. That may not always be the case. Okay. If you have a cache, so what you have to do is if you are reading a block, you are going to say, is the block already in my cache? If so, you are going to pick it up from there and return. If not, only then you trigger I.O. And the same is uh, with write. 
after writing to it, you also write it to the cache and then you write it off to disk. Now, whenever you have caches, there are two important things you'll have to deal with. One is what is referred to as cache replacement policy and the other is whether you are going to use a write through or a write back cache. I don't know when you did 230 or uh, maybe 230. Did you come across write through and write back caching? It was also dealt with at a hardware level, so not just a software issue. Anybody know what write through or write back is? No. Okay. So, so any cache that you have okay, is uh, holding a subset of the data that's also stored on some other entity. In this case, it's an I/O device. Write through policy basically says if you are writing something to the cache, you are also going to send that write immediately off to the I/O device. Okay. So basically, it says write to all levels of memory containing the block. So that write is percolating not only through the cache but immediately to the I/O device. Write back policy says that if you are writing to the I/O device, you write to the cache, which is memory, and you say, uh, return to the application at some later time. That block is going to be sent off to the disk. Okay, so that's the difference between write through and write back. Let me show an example here just to clarify. Okay, this is something that you have to keep in mind. It's an important, so let's take the disk as an example of our I/O device. Here is your buffer cache. It's an OS buffer cache. This has some blocks that are cached, and this is an application. So application says write to block I. Okay. So what you will do is you will basically go and take this block and you stick it into the buffer cache. And the write through and write back differ based on what happens next. Okay. In write through, you will immediately take whatever you have written here and also send it off to the disk. And your Apple, the write command is blocked until you have updated the buffer cache and you have updated the disk. Okay? So when the write returns, you know that the data has actually reached the disk. Okay? That is write through caching. Write back caching is the opposite where you only write that to the cache and you are going to return to the application saying so a write finished. Okay, so the application assumes that the write is actually completed, but it has not reached the disk, it's only reached the buffer cache. At some later point in time, the OS is going to call a flush, which will take this block, which is a dirty block, and evict it to disk. Okay, so these two policies are going to give you a fundamental trade-off. Okay, safety versus performance. The first one is gives you higher reliability, it's safer. Okay, because when a write finishes, you know the data has reached the disk. Okay, so think of the following. Let's say you open, a, let's say you have, you're working on your lab, you open that core source code in your editor, you make some changes, you hit save. Okay, and then let's say the save completes. So what's your expectation at this point in time? Okay, you are expecting that you saved the file, so you are expecting that the file is actually now on disk. Okay? So now if you, let's say it's a PC, you turn off the power on the PC. Okay? And you now reboot the machine and you look at the disk, since you saved your file before you turned off the power, you expect that that file should be on disk. Okay? That's your normal expectation. Okay? If you implement write through caching, that is exactly what will actually happen. You hit save, okay? the file that you change, which is your source code, will hit the buffer cache, it will also get written out to disk. And now it's on disk, so you can turn off the power, but disk is persistent, so the data is there. Okay. Think about write back policy. You hit save, okay. whatever file you are trying to save, the source code is gone to the buffer cache. Okay. And your, your editor says done, okay. because the write has returned, okay. the editor is saying you're done. Okay. Now you turn off power. And you now reboot your machine and you say that the, what is on disk is still the old version of the file. The changes you made are not on disk. Okay, because they are still in RAM, they have not yet been written off before you turned off power. Okay, so you lost some changes you made. Okay, is that clear? What the difference is? So, 
So here, so this is clearly safer. So you are getting what you expect. So then you may ask why do write back at all. Okay, so it should be clear that this is going to give you speed and performance. Okay, write yeah. back, basically you saved and you are done. So this save is going to be much faster because all you have done is taken the file and stuck it into the OS kernel memory and you tell the application you are done. I saved your file for you, I wrote it out. Okay, I mean I finished the write as finished, you actually didn't write it out. So now you at some later point you are going to send that off to this. In most cases that will work okay because failures are not the common case, they are an exception. Okay, so in most cases in a few seconds after you did save, the OS will go leisurely and write this out to this. So in a few seconds the data will appear on <coughs> this, but the application doesn't have to wait for a slow IO command. Okay. The write through policy, every write will see the full latency of the disk. In the write back policy, writes are finishing at the rate at which you can write them into an OS buffer cache. So you'll see much better performance in this case. Your writes seem like they are going through very fast even though the disk is a very slow device. Right? And that's not the case for write through. You will actually see, so this is a fundamental trade off between speed and reliability. Okay? So you, as a OS designer you have to pick what is it that you care. Will you give better performance to your users, okay? but take the risk that occasionally your machine may hang before it has flushed its buffer cache. Somebody may just unplug the PC okay, and the machine just basically freezes because of, and then there is some unwritten data and you are going to lose it. Okay. And if you are willing to pay the price of some occasional data loss, you can get much better performance. If you don't want to pay the price, you will see this, the pain of having to write to a slow device every time you do a write. Okay. So it's a fundamental trade-off. The other advantage you get in write back policy is what is called write batching or write coalescing. If you do multiple saves, let's say you change one line, okay, you hit save and you, then you make one more change and you hit save. Okay. If you do this in quick succession, okay, you basically keep writing to the same block twice and those two writes become one write at the disk level. So you bash the writes and you reduce the number of writes that have to go out. Okay. Less work has to be done because that block is being written too frequently. This is especially true if you are writing one byte at a time. I just said one byte becomes one block write. Okay, so let's say you write one byte and that basically gets written to that block. Then you write the next byte which you append something that gets written to the next byte of the block. If you had write through each of those bytes would have become one block write. Okay, one byte becomes 512 bytes or 1 kilobyte write to the disk, lot more work. If you have write back, all of them get batched and typically you write it out, write out uh, dirty blocks every 10 to 30 seconds okay, at a time. So you wait for half a minute before you write out a dirty block. In that time period, other writes may arrive to the block, they all get batched and you basically write out one block. Okay, so you get the performance, you get sort of the benefit of batching. All of this is true except that if you lose power or your OS hangs or there is a kernel crash, which are all infrequent, rare, but you will lose some data that is not been written on. Okay. Uh, this, this, all of this has been true for disk, but this write through and write back is fundamentally a, a policy that you associate with the cache. It has nothing to do with disk. The same is true for whether this is a hardware cache for memory or is a cache for disk. Any time you write, the question is are you only going to write to the cache or are you also going to write to the device for which this is a cache for whether it's RAM, it's disk or some other device is not material. Okay. So these two concepts are very general, okay. they relate to any cache. Okay. What we talked about is how it relates to IO devices here and now you sort of understand the trade-offs. Okay. So cache, caching policy, you have to make this decision, okay. are you going to do safety or reliability? Any questions on this? So you will see, I should mention this one last point, you will see that early versions of operating systems went with write through policies. And they said safety is paramount, we can't afford to lose users data. More modern versions pretty much have all switched to write back policies because they have tried to go for uh, performance over uh, reliability. So this is why if the power fails or a machine hangs, when you reboot the machine, you have to do a file system consistency check. 
because you may be writing to an i note you may be writing to a super block you may not be losing data for a file you may be in the midst of writing to the metadata of the file so if you lose some information in an i node you may actually have sort of an inconsistent file system okay you have to actually do consistency checks to ensure that even though some data is missing the file system uh, data structures are in a consistent state you don't have some weird inconsistency where you are in the midst of deleting a file half the blocks are there and then your i node is in some weird situation that you have to reclaim it and so on so you pay extra price by doing extra checks. So you say write back, but when, the, when you reboot, you are going to do extra checks to make sure that the data was, uh, whatever is written, at least is in some consistency. Some data may be lost, but that's okay. okay. This is also the reason if you actually have ever rebooted a Linux machine, when you actually issue shutdown, you'll see the first thing that appears on the screen is flushing buffers. And what it's simply doing is whenever you shut down, the first thing you do is go to the buffer cache and write out everything that's dirty. Okay, so let's take whatever needs to be written out and write it out before we shut down the machine. Okay, so if you do clean shutdown, none of this will happen because the first thing you do when you do a clean shutdown your machine is you go and clear out the buffer cache, write out all of the blocks. Okay, so these are things that you put in place just to uh, sort of reduce the chances that some bad things may happen. Okay, so we finished the discussion. This is the big picture of what uh, your device driver looks like and how the read request or a write request is processed. So requests come from users. Okay, so OS is going to first check if there's buffers. You're going to check is whatever you're reading already in a buffer cache. If so, there's no I.O. So you're done. If not, let's say you're using the most sophisticated uh, device driver, which is interrupt driven and DMA based. So you tell the DMA controller, saying go read uh, some block, here is a buffer. DMA controller is basically going to work with the device, directly transfer that data into RAM once you're done. And the CPU is off doing something else at this point. Once you're done, you're going to interrupt the CPU. Okay, the CPU will then say some data has appeared in the buffer and it's going to hand it over to the user process. Okay, and the user process is blocked in, during this period. It's sitting on the wait queue. Once its read operation is finished, it will be scheduled for execution and once it executes, it gets the read. Okay. So things are happening at different levels. Okay. The process level, OS level, device level, okay, they are all happening concurrently. So you need to keep this big picture in mind uh, when thinking about how I.O. percolates all the way from the application level to the OS, to the controller, to the device. So DM, this is the same thing in picture, which I will skip in the interest of time. Okay, so and this is the flow chart, which essentially also says the same thing. This is taken from the book. And the, basically you have request coming in and it says, is it in the buffer cache? If so, you just return. If it's not in the buffer cache, you're going to basically go through the chain to do the DMAs and interrupt driven uh, processing and so on. Okay. So I'm going to stop here for today. We will run out of time. Uh, so we are done with IO devices. We still have a few more things to talk about as far as devices are concerned and then we'll switch to the last component of the course which is uh, going to be on uh, distributed systems, network programming and so on. Okay, so the last part is all on distributed aspects of their operating systems.